why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And then the, I know that you two, uh, I mean, know each other. So how do you guys know each other? Um, you know, obviously, you know, I'm Jason Kim. I'm a senior partner, general partner at a U.S. venture capital firm called Legendary Ventures. Um, how I know Peter is I met him a few years ago um, through some friends. Um, also, within kind of the broader startup industry, um, Ukraine, that, you know, Peter is very active in. Um, we share a lot of common interests, both in science and technology, uh, specifically around kind of emerging consumer med health companies. And it's been a pleasure to get to know him. He has a very fascinating background. Okay, thank you. Uh, how about Peter? All right. A couple of words about me. Uh, I used to uh, work as a CEO of uh, some very big corporations, big corporations, Western-owned corporation in uh, former Soviet Union uh, area. So I used to be CEO for three of them. Uh, it uh, was consumer business and uh, also mobile operators. Uh, and uh, right now I am a board member for uh, biggest Ukrainian pharmaceutical company. And um, uh, yeah, I am uh, also, as uh, Jason said, involved in a Ukraine uh, startup uh, scenery, you can say it this way, industry or whatever. And uh, I like it uh, and uh, it helps that I have my basic education as mathematician. I used to graduate a uh, very good mathematical faculty from Soviet Union, if you know what it is, long time ago. Yeah, and it helps. And uh, because I built certain reputation in this country, it also helps to meet uh, people that I want to meet. And we met uh, with Jason, I think, one and a half years ago in Ukraine through some potential investments that uh, Jason was considering at the time. It didn't materialize for him, but it did materialize for me and the company I'm a board member in. So we keep talking since then. And finally, we have this unusual interview. I understand I'm in uh, Kiev, David in Hong Kong, and uh, Jason, God knows where Jason is. Yes, very interesting. I'm currently right. in New York, yeah, but I'm about to leave for San Francisco. So. Right. <laughs> so, uh, the Jason in the West and myself in East Asia. And then the, how people call the Ukraine, it is uh, East or West or whatever. <laughs> um, it depends who you ask. I mean, All right. Obviously, it's a former uh, Soviet country. Uh, but it's a country that uh, wants to be in Europe, uh, tries to be in Europe. Yes. And um, uh, that may be uh, a big difference with some other former Soviet countries. So uh, if you come to Kiev, I recently read a report from a uh, very good um, American magazine saying that uh, Kiev nightclubs are now best in Europe. So if you want to hang out really in a real great night, yeah, yeah. If you want to really hang out in a nice night nightclub, you shouldn't anymore go to Berlin, where everybody wants to uh, to be going. You should go to Kiev. It's uh, the same quality, much cheaper, and um, the people are much friendlier. Yeah, I'm eager to find it out someday, right? Yeah. Yeah, before we talk about uh, our topics, I think uh, people in Asia, I'm from South Korea, uh, Asian people do not have much knowledge about uh, Ukraine, right? Of course, they understand briefly on the high level where it is located, or so there used to be part of the Soviet Union, or so uh, well developed in terms of technology, or so known as IT outsourcing center. But beside that, in fact, about the culture and then the society, uh, pe Asian people do not have much information. But let me, in terms of icebreaker, let me introduce a very interesting, funny, I mean, interesting, popular joke from South Korea about Ukraine. Uh, most famous joke about uh, Ukraine, I I'm not sure the who made that joke, but the, uh, everybody, every Korean knows that the, if you visit Ukraine in Ukraine, uh, there are so many uh, pretty girls who look like uh, Kim Tae-hee, who, who is the most famous and pretty actress in Korea. 
the so many Kim Tae pro and the farm in the countryside. So Ukraine known as a country of the a lot of beauty. So what do you what do you think about that comment? Are you asking Jason or myself? You, Jason. I, I think Jason is not a right person to qualify that, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, it's a, a interesting comment coming from a uh, Korean uh, side, yeah. and uh, uh, I think that we here in Ukraine we sort of take it for granted. Yes. Uh, because uh, we see a lot of very pretty girls uh, that uh, live in Ukraine and we don't think that it's something unusual. But I know because I have a lot of foreign friends, when they come to Ukraine, they don't take it for granted. They are really uh, shaken. They right. really uh, sort of uh, absolutely surprised uh, and they like it. And I have to say that most of those pretty girls are not anymore working in any agriculture. Don't believe yeah. this joke. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, they use uh, they, they live in the cities. They work in offices or uh, they work in uh, restaurants. I don't know in uh, other hospitality segment. And uh, uh, that's fantastic country uh, because people are friendly. And uh, you can really meet uh, interesting people here. But I have, I have to say that Korea recently built a new reputation. Whatever Korea was uh, famous before, uh, big companies, mobile phones, uh, cutting edge technology, now nobody cares about this. You are squid game country. Right. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, squid game. Uh, after the success of, huge success of Parasite last year, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, let's talk about business. Uh, Peter, can you tell us a little bit about something uh, great about the Ukraine and Eastern Europe, including the advancement in science and technology from the investment perspective? Okay, uh, so as I'm coming from a Soviet Union, and my grandfather was a very famous mathematician from Soviet Union, really. Um, who made a great uh, contribution into math into former Soviet Union. I met a lot of people in this country uh, doing math and physics. And we have to clearly understand that in Soviet Union, all those, uh, as we say, natural sciences like math, uh, physics, uh, chemistry, and so on, engineering, they were developing uh, developed by uh, the government and the party who was ruling the state only to prepare better for the future war. So it's not uh, to develop science for the sake of the science. It's to prepare for the war. It's to develop the munitions, arms, and so on. And that's why natural sciences in Soviet Union, they were really, really well developed. And uh, it were a lot of very well-known uh, scientists. Not many of them uh, did got a Nobel Prize because a lot of those scientists were secret scientists because they were preparing for the war, but nevertheless, they existed. So there is still a culture of uh, quite good uh, natural sciences education in the country. And um, uh, there are still a lot, uh, very, no, not a lot, but there are still some good quality universities who uh, teach people in natural science, sciences. And uh, uh, right now, uh, it's very popular in Ukraine to uh, study in so-called computer science, sciences or IT, as people say here, because here computer science as a term is not really very well known. People say, I am getting my qualification in IT. And uh, uh, there are good uh, teachers, uh, great students, and uh, it's very fashionable. Now, if you are boy, mostly boy, but there are some girls obviously also doing this. And uh, uh, if you are doing your studies and then career in IT, uh, you are very popular uh, in the society. People like you, people want to be friends with you. You are making very good money and uh, you are working with some interesting people and companies from the West. So that's uh, how you can look in Ukraine. I mean, if you want a uh, very brief description, we all know about a really fantastic success of IT outsourcing in India because they have a lot of big companies now doing IT outsourcing. You can think of Ukraine as so-called European India or India for Europe. Uh, 
Yes. Because outsourcing here is just uh, huge. Uh, I read recently that uh, we have around 300,000 people working in um, IT companies, mostly in outsourcing. But you know, uh, in most of the countries, uh, all IT co companies studying this outsourcing. And then later on, when uh, smart and bright founders uh, think of some products, they branch out and set up little product companies. That's how it happened in all the countries. Yeah, that sounds very natural, Pat. Yeah. Yes, that's what's happening in Ukraine. And I'm an uh, investor in some of these product companies. I have no investments in um, uh, outsourcing companies because it's, uh, I think it's boring. It's very boring. Uh, on top of uh, not very highly profitable, it's also very boring. Uh, so uh, Ukraine is going the right way, but we can later discuss. And here I want to listen to Jason's point of view because Ukraine has a lot of, things going on for Ukraine, but also we have a lot of um, uh, bad things or things not happening in Ukraine that slow down the development of uh, startups, scenery and uh, overall IT industry. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I kind of agree with Peter on his comments. I, you know, my experience with Ukraine dating back Few years ago, um, I, I first got to the country because we had, um, uh, you know, we have a we have an LP or a member of our team who's a good friend is the CTO of a, a tech company in Ukraine, and that's how I got first introduced to the industry and and kind of the people as well as the culture. And I learned very quickly that it's a very I think you know Peter has it exactly right. I think it's a very STEM oriented, very strong society rooted in kind of science and technology, you know, computer science, like you said, is a very big area of study. Um, you know, the fundamentals of, I think, younger Ukrainian people in terms of, you know, look at, look at Peter, right? He's got a very strong background in science and math. So all those, all those elements are there. Um, I think it's interesting to see Ukraine kind of transform from an agrarian society and I don't know the history as well as Peter, but it seemed like it skipped some manufacturing and is moving right into information technology and kind of, you know, through those stages of industrialization, I think you're seeing a combination of both right now, right? Where you have a really young, smart, growing STEM kind of population, right? Um, kind of going. I, I, ha I, I have to say that uh, when you come to Kiev, but not only to Kiev, Kiev is the capital of the country, but some other uh, big uh, and medium-sized cities in Ukraine, you see immediately a lot of advertising everywhere. Uh, advertising for courses in that data science, uh, coding, machine learning, artificial intelligence, everything. You see advertising for these courses. It's uh, quite unusual for Europe, I have to say. There are so many of these uh, courses, I think too many, in my view, and people oh, wow. go, they pay money, they study at these courses, then it's a, uh, like a natural process, the best people going for the, the very best people setting up the companies, but there is a really uh, stage for Ukraine IT industry. The problem is, I, I mean, and sorry, just to improve on this, uh, it's much bigger than in Eastern European countries around Ukraine, like Hungary, Poland, or Czech Republic. And uh, mm. uh, it seems that Ukrainian people like it and they can do it quite well. The problem is yeah. that in Ukraine, uh, the legal system is barely working. The court system is a complete disaster. So you can think, I mean, it's, uh, I, I didn't prepare this, but it just came to my mind. You can think about building a company uh, with fantastic IT specialists, uh, very smart people, but in legal environment like Afghanistan. I see. That's yeah. not the best think, idea think, to think, think of. Yeah, I think I think David to Peter's point, just kind of retouching, you know, some some of the you know some of the components of kind of Ukraine development, right, as a global like kind of force. Um, technology is clearly on the forefront, and I just, I personally think, and I'm not an expert like Peter is, but just from my experience, it seems like there's a, 
kind of cross-culturalization of challenges that are happening, meaning you're seeing the shift in society from an agrarian to, by and large, a, a technology-focused kind of mentality. Peter's point, you have a lot of younger people who have a very strong STEM background, and they're growing. Um, and I'd love to hear, by the way, Peter's thoughts more on kind of this advertising and this kind of rush to technology, because it seems like, that, you know, there's, there's, there's good and bad things about that. But I think because you have this younger population trying to do this, um, and you've got this backdrop of you know, an older generation in uh, more traditional industries, I think that collision is kind of what's happening now, which is why if you look at Ukraine, it's by and large a services environment, right? It's, it's yet to really, you know, become a product focused kind of late industrial country, right? From an economic development standpoint. Um, but I just wanted to ask Peter, kind of based on this kind of mix of science, technology, education, and where society is headed, and you know, you know, you live there, you know, as the VC ecosystem, as well as the startup industry kind of grows, do you think, uh, you know, what, what do you think will be the first kind of industries and categories that will emerge, right? There's a whole host of them. And under this kind of transformation, you know, you know, where do you think the hot categories are, right? Is it in mobile? <clears throat> Is it in you know, retail? Is it in consumer? Is it in health? I mean, where, where do you think, you know, the next, if you look next, you know, over the next five to seven years, where do you think it will develop? All right. Uh, as I said, uh, there are uh, many things uh, furthering the development of Ukrainian VC uh, environment. The first, as I think, and I think it's the most important, it's a lot of uh, uh, outsourcing companies. Uh, they teach people, they show them how to set up uh, correct working processes. Uh, they show them how to satisfy the customer, and that's very important. Second, there are a lot of uh, foreign companies setting up R&D centers in Ukraine, mostly IT R&D centers. And here I can mention Samsung, Intel, a lot of Chinese companies, uh, uh, medium-sized companies coming, coming from US, Germany, Israel, especially setting up here R&D centers. Uh, they don't invest in hardware too much because of a bad legal uh, system in a, in a company. They just hire very smart people. They buy uh, computers for them and they uh, set them the tasks. And obviously, that's a second component because all those companies, they bring something to Ukraine, people learn it, and then they also think about setting up their own product company, doing something maybe competing to those companies. And as there are so many Western companies doing this, for example, I have to mention Ubisoft, you know, this leading uh, gaming company, they have R&D center in Kiev. Uh, 1,200 people working in this uh, R&D center. It's, it's quite, quite a lot. So obviously, it's very opportunistic. There are gaming companies, there are cheap companies, there are uh, consumer uh, companies like Samsung. They are setting up something here uh, in Kiev. People learn from him, from them, and then they set up their own company. So it can be everything. It can be gaming. It's a lot of Ukrainian-based game, gaming companies. Uh, it can be agricultural. Uh, IT companies, a lot of agriculture in Ukraine, so people like to uh, make it more automated, uh, base it on uh, machine learning and so on. Uh, and um, uh, the, the, the thing is that I cannot answer Jason's question very clearly. I mean, I cannot say which part of uh, IT industry will prevail in Ukraine future. I think it's very opportunistic and it's connected to big outsource companies and big Western companies setting up R&D centers in Ukraine. So that's two biggest factors uh, promoting uh, Ukraine IT and VC scenery. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with, with you, Peter. It's, it's completely, I, I completely agree with Peter in the sense that I think it's uh, unpredictable, right? With a growing economy and a, and, a, and a growing environment, right? Like Ukraine, what the hot categories or industries will be. Uh, my perspective is I, I think that what Peter is generally outlining to me, what it sounds like is there's gonna be a, you know, if you look at, at any society that transitions from a service-based environment to a product kind of focused economy, 
Um, and you saw a lot of this in China. Um, and if you use that as a model, right, it's not to say Ukraine will be, you know, like China, but if you have to use something as a model, um, it's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm very focused on consumer uh, as well as kind of retail technology, because I think um, if you look at Ukraine, it's the second largest uh, country in the Eastern European corridor, right, um, per, you know, by population. And I think that country will continue to grow just because of the, pop, you know, it's the population growth just given its sheer size, um, will have an insatiable appetite for consumer products. So I think whether it's consumer software or consumer tech, anything around that area, um, I think it's going to be probably the first to emerge because it has relevant value to an end user, right? And that's how you scale up. Um, you know, I think, I, I think they'll all, they'll, they'll, you know, on the B2B side, I think you'll definitely see, you know, IT lead that, you know, like Peter said, and you'll see a lot of software innovation for businesses. But ultimately, I think the growth will be achieved through B2C. And I think it's the reason why Peter and I look at some similar companies, right? I'm, you know, him and I both have a background in um, kind of either financing or technology. But from an end use perspective, you know, he, he's now in, you know, pharma, right? And, you know, I'm looking at all different categories, including you know, consumer health for our fund. And, you know, we're not probably the most subject matter experts. We're not doctors and scientists, but we can clearly understand that there's going to be a need for these things. Um, and I think that's why Peter's invested in that one company um, that kind of bridges the world between science and technology at a consumer level. And, uh, you know, it's the same reason why our company just, you know, invested in a, an Asian-based uh, posturepedic consumer med tech posturepedic business. Um, so I, I think yes. I think that's kind of where it's headed. Yes, I actually I did a quick research because I don't have much uh, experience about the crane and crane the business ecosystem. So I found a lot of good story about the crane. Right, uh, it's uh, like uh, IT talents and top outsourcing destination for seven consecutive years by the Gartners and then a lot of good story, but. Uh, uh, a common thing is uh, a lot of people, media talk about challenges in local regulation laws related to the growth and promotion of the local business, right? So, uh, I mean, uh, about uh, Jason, uh, you, well, you you try to compare to, uh, Ukraine to China in longer term, yeah, I agree, but uh, China has a very strong government leadership, whether it is democratic or, or not, right? So that it will be challenging, but challenging issue. I under I agree that uh, someone should sort it sort it out. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think Ukrainian, as I said, <clears throat> has a lot of things going for it. But as I said, the other things uh, first is a bad legal system, <clears throat> and second, there is no venture finance in the country. Yeah, so that's what I a, what I found too. Yeah, all, yeah early yeah. stage investment, uh, lack of early stage investment, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, people here, they are uh, like a very perfectionist people. They are building things and then sometimes develop the things to perfection. Be it uh, the software code or hardware things, they really build it to perfection. But then when the time comes to commercialize the things. They don't know first how to do it. Secondly, they don't have the resources to uh, do it. And here, uh, the Western contribution, and when I say Western, uh, I mean the West is Europe, uh, USA, uh, Korea is also very much uh, West for Ukraine. Hong Kong also very much Western company. It's a paradox, of course, but it's a Western company in terms of development for Ukraine. People coming from those countries with uh, a lot of experience like Jason, uh, bringing uh, contacts, bringing finance, bringing uh, accumulators uh, uh, or incubators to Ukraine. It's, uh, there are a lot of them now in Ukraine, mostly who came from uh, Europe, but also some from Asia. And this is very important when combined with Ukrainian people, talent, uh, to uh, invent and improve things. So we have a lot of things good for Ukraine, but some things are definitely lacking here. And that's why we need people like Jason and his colleagues and his competitors coming more and more to Ukraine. How what about, uh, I mean, the, in order to sort out or the mitigate the uh, legal system issue in Ukraine, what about the idea of setting up the international business plan 
from from the beginning. For example, setting up the company outside of Ukraine and then yeah, try yeah, to yeah. leverage the talent and then the I mean the experience. Let me let me Ukraine. let me elaborate on this. First, right. uh, uh, I forgot to mention that there is a very unusual but uh, very high very nice benefit for Ukrainian IT people. That's a special tax regime for people working in IT company companies. It was not designed for IT companies, but somehow it happens that it's uh, very widely used in IT companies. So right now in Ukraine, if you employ somebody in IT, uh, he or she usually pays 5% income tax, which is fantastic. Single rate, flat rate. Yes, yes, flat rate. Yeah, that's, yes, that's cheaper than tax heaven. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it's, it's a fantastic rate. Fantastic. Uh, Recently, also, Ukrainian parliament uh, set up a special uh, zone where Ukrainian IT company can register, and they have a special regime. It's been done to safeguard Ukrainian companies from brutality of existing legal system. How it will be yeah. working, we have no ideas because uh, the law just been uh, signed. But I have to answer you that when you uh, talk to Ukrainian company, usually it's not Ukrainian registered company. I would say that in 99% the company you are talking to uh, is registered either in Delaware or in Cyprus. It depends, Delaware or Cyprus. Uh, companies who are mostly aiming to US, they register their business in Delaware and all of them are sitting in Ukraine actually, but business is Delaware registered. And companies who are aiming for European development, they often set up the business in Cyprus. Uh, so uh, people are sitting in Ukraine, but it's not an Ukrainian business legal entity. Uh, so people yeah, know it, but is, it. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add. This is very similar to you know UAE, Abu Dhabi, where they've set up a uh, kind of more business friendly zone, uh, similar to the Holy See and the Vatican. Yeah, so. It's interesting, Peter, how that's going to work out. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. No, no, it's it's okay. It's uh, obviously when Ukraine parliament, Ukraine government uh, invented this scheme, they copied it from some other countries. Obviously, they didn't make it from the very beginning. And uh, uh, when the company is early stage, it works. But then when the company is uh, coming out of age, a uh, couple of the founders and maybe top people of the company, uh, they are moving to uh, US, to London, to Berlin. But mostly all the developers are still sitting in Ukraine. And then yeah. in this financial center in US, New York or, or Silicon Valley, London or Berlin, they can talk to the uh, VC people, to real VC people and get some financing for the company. But still the development will be done from Ukraine. That's how it works uh, right now. So they already have been exploring the way I, I just suggested. Of course, of course. You know, people are creative. And when they yes. see the stupidity and brutality of the legal system, of course, uh, they find the way around. And yeah. uh, that's pretty legal, absolutely logical way around. And they are exploring it in a big way. Right. Interesting. Right. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, David, the other challenge here is just not the legal, right? I absolutely agree with that. But even if they set up these structures, I mean, we haven't talked about it. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit later. But you know, there's also there's the the legal challenges, and there's the operating stability issues, right? Um, of even having a back end team in Ukraine, given some of the political challenges that they've seen as a country, um, and just the cultural nuances. Um, and you know, maybe we could talk about that a little bit later. But I think the combination of those things are, I think, what creates a lot of challenges, right? Like for someone like Peter, he's worked both in the East and the West, so he understands both cultures. And that's an area that we haven't spoke about, um, but you can have as much legal framework as you want, but, I'll, but if, if you don't have good people at the end of the day, and those people aren't qualified to understand how to run a very disparate global decentralized business and the whole thing could flop, right? So you, you're, you're essentially asking a startup founder in the worst case, um, you know, instead of building something locally, be successful and then grow and, you know, learn how to manage your business and then expand the business globally, you're instantly putting some people in a situation where they have to go from, you know, a first time founder with very little business operating experience to someone who understands the 
you know, how to run a very complex decentralized organization. And, and that's a critical point of failure, I think, for most, you know, first time founders. Yeah. Yes. I understand uh, there are a lot of, uh, I mean, very successful startup in Ukraine, right? Or that we do of Ukraine origin. So something like Unicorn. So can you tell us a couple of the famous successful startup from Ukraine? And then okay. what, what, uh, what kind of business model do they have? Uh, look, <laughs> when we talk uh, unicorns from Ukraine, uh, usually, I mean, not usually, 100%, it's uh, some company that uh, includes Ukrainian founder. Yes. But the company is not working yeah. uh, in Ukraine. For example, one of the most famous uh, companies in the world, WhatsApp, has yeah. Ukrainian founder. It's a guy from Ukraine, but he emigrated from Ukraine when he was very young, yeah. but he's Ukrainian. Yeah. Okay. And uh, even uh, another interesting example, uh, we all know that uh, Apple, a company, Apple is a company, was set up by two Steves. Steve uh, Jobs as uh, mostly most famous Steve, but there was another Steve, if you remember, Steve Wozniak. Steve. Yes. Okay. And this guy is also Ukrainian. I see. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow, yes, that's amazing. Yes. I didn't know Wozniak was a Ukrainian. Yes. Wow. That's yes, crazy. he is Ukrainian. He sometimes visits Ukraine, gives the lectures, but yes, he's of Ukrainian origin. Uh, but he, he was never be, uh, he's never been an Ukrainian citizen, obviously. But if we are talking about uh, co companies uh, right now who are having unicorn status, you can mention Revolut, you know, this London-based company. And the second founder, not the uh, largest founder, but the second founder is Ukrainian. They met in London. Uh, the first founder yep. is Russian, by the way. By the way. Uh, yeah. And there is a company who recently made an IPO in US, uh, GitLab. Uh, you, you know this company, GitLab, valued at $15 billion. Uh, the main founder is from Ukraine. And uh, I understand now he has only 5% of the company. But uh, given $15 billion valuation, it's still a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is. Yeah, the, uh, I, I think along yeah. Peter's line, that's been my experience too, David. So another big company that has a Ukrainian component to it is a company like Grammarly. And in that case, yeah, Grammarly. Yes, so, I heard about yeah, it, Grammarly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And in that case, it's exactly like Peter said. Like I think in his example, you had U Ukrainians of origin, right, who are really not living in Ukraine, who grew up or were educated outside the country. Like in Revolut's case, right, um, that based and met, you know, they met and they developed their business out of London. I think in Grammarly's case, it's a very similar story. You have a Ukrainian component, but they're really a San Francisco-based company. Um, right. And most of their founders have a U.S. culture, but you have these ties back to Ukraine. And a lot of them, rightfully so, use them um, to build R&D or kind of engineering centers in Ukraine, they come back home to do that. And so I think there's this common notion in Ukraine um, that, you know, there's these kind of unicorns that came out of Ukraine, but that's not really true. Um, yes. I don't know if Peter, I don't know if Peter agrees with that. I think it's great that they're exporting talent and they're doing these great things around the world. But I think there are very few unicorns coming from, you know, from a technology perspective that are base built you know, and developed out of Ukraine, right? Yeah, and that's I think what, it's because yeah, of these other yeah, challenges. Yeah, yeah, that's what I found too. Yes. But story, the story you just uh, explained to me quite sounds similar to the Parisian because I have seen a lot of smart people, successful people, successful in the yeah. outside Iran, right? They're, they're from Iran. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, as uh, I want to say that right now, the technology companies, they are very multinationals right? Uh, because uh, each nationality enriches the other people around itself. So it can be a company where there are Ukrainians, Persian, Germans, French, and they talk to each other. They have a lot of contacts back home where they can outsource the development, uh, customer testing, whatever. But they meet in some very well-known 
uh, centers of the world like uh, Valley, New York, London, maybe Berlin, maybe Israel, and they work uh, in those countries to develop their companies. Yeah, so it's yeah. multinational. You cannot be very nationalistic when you talk about uh, VC yeah. business nowadays. Yeah, right. but True. I think the big, but I think the big difference though is that most of those successful companies have an origination not you know physically from outside of ukraine i've yet to actually meet a unicorn founder from ukraine that lives in ukraine that built his business in ukraine and then expanded globally it's typically the other way around which is what yes 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 it's, yes it's mostly multinational those types of companies that reach that scale are going outside in right they're they're ukrainians that are living out that, that have been for the most part has probably even been educated outside of U ukraine and they live outside of Ukraine. Um, in Grammarly's case, most of them are US citizens, but they have this origination and they go back to it, to their home country. Um, so if you look at unicorn development from within, I don't see many. If you look at it from without, you know, you see um, some out there, but I think it's kind of outwards in, not inwards out, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Recently, a few months ago, I interviewed the founder of the one of the largest classified ad e-commerce company in Nigeria. Uh, he said he's from Crane. He, he used to work for the IT outsourcing company, but he wanted to grow, I mean, launch and grow the business in Africa. Quite yeah, ob obviously he somehow got hooked on Africa, right. found some colleagues, friends in Africa, and he decided it's unexplored market. And he's a brave man because in Ukraine, you have to be brave yeah. to succeed. Right. And uh, he yeah, yeah. went uh, to Nigeria. It's not very often happening that people go to Nigeria from abroad to set up a business. Right. Uh, you have to be really bold to do this. So he was and he went and he set up and I think he's a multimillionaire now, which is fantastic yes. example for Ukrainian youngsters. Yes. Agree. Agree. Yeah. Okay. So... Uh... Jason, would you like to ask some of the question uh, we haven't covered yet? Yeah, I mean, you know, on that note, Peter, um, I mean, I think we've talked a lot of, about Ukraine, its business environment, you know, in, including some strengths and weaknesses, um, you know, specifically, you know, challenges, um, you know, but I'm wondering what you think the benefits are, like beyond the outsourcing, you know, and the great talent that Ukraine has, I mean, do you see any areas where there's kind of a hint and a glimmer of, uh, you know, I guess hope, um, you know, and, or maybe a seed for the future where you see this, the country from within going from service to product and that mentality is changing, right? I know you're invested in a couple of startups yourself that by and large was, you know, kind of, you know, incubated and built out of, out of Ukraine. And so there, there are youngsters and there are younger people trying to do this now out of Ukraine. So I think the mentality is shifting to more of a product culture. And I'm wondering if, you know, you and, you know, uh, the businesses that you're affiliated with, you know, have you seen that within Ukraine? I mean, we've largely talked about kind of multinational business development, but I'm wondering from within, from within Ukraine, the system, you know, do you see that kind of change happening now? Yeah. Uh uh, when we talk about Ukraine, I have to say this, this is very important. We are talking about um, people working for different IT businesses. They get very decent remuneration and they, uh, they are allowed to select their uh, geography they are living. So they can move to not to any country, but they, move, they can move to many different countries who are trying to attract this young talent. So if you IT guy right now in the world, it's not difficult to change your country of living. It's, uh, it's quite easy. And the thing is that right now in Ukraine, if you make some not very big but decent money, say $2,000 a month, it's, a, it's not huge money, but it's a decent money. You can live extremely comfortably. You can live uh, quite well. You are not doing luxury life, of course, but you are living a uh, very good life which you cannot afford for the same sort of money uh, say in uh, london it's absolutely not possible to live decently for this sort of money in london or new york or, or hong kong uh, but in ukraine you can do it the country is very comfortable for living it's a uh, nice weather 
it's nice people nice restaurants a lot of service uh, services around it's very easy to set everything uh, i mean you call your plumber and plumber gets tomorrow try to do the same in new york you fail uh, i try to do the same in um, uh, my uh, second home country scotland it always fails he never comes uh, so <laughs> yeah it's 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 very easy country to live in if you have a decent income and it people they are very easily movable crowd uh, for example you may have heard of that last year it was a lot of political turmoil in a neighboring country called belarus it was um, like a sort of revolution in belarus and uh, people didn't like it and most of it people just left the country you uh, come to belarus and belarus used to have a very thriving it industry a couple of years ago there is not anymore they all run out some of them run to ukraine some of them run to russia uh, some of them run to europe but they are very easy to to to, to make a run because uh, they often don't have a family and if they do they they are renting some apartments they they would rent them in berlin or kiev or london or wherever and they still can command the same decent salary in those cities. So uh, Ukraine seems to be attracting a lot of IT talent who doesn't want to leave the country, who is very comfortable living and staying here and developing their careers. It says a lot about Ukraine as a uh, comfortable country for living. And uh, as we talk about product companies, here we really, really need a big Western involvement in terms of contact, financing, legal setup, and without this, it cannot develop. Uh, so uh, Jason maybe better can elaborate on this, whether he expects that those Western uh, funds, uh, legal companies, uh, financial institution would be able to come to Ukraine any anytime soon. I don't know. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge in, from a financing perspective is if you evaluate early stage companies, I've met some great early stage founders in Ukraine. And if Peter were to ask me, why don't you invest in them? It's not because of the idea, right? Our biggest concern is we don't know if the founders have the experience to be able to get to market and commercialize their product. And it's not because they don't want to, and it's not because they don't care. It's just, they never, first of all, the market is, is not Ukraine, you know, as a retail market, right? Per se. It's not large enough. So even if they're successful, that success is not really indicative of what they could really succeed or what that succeed might look like and the success might look like in the future. Um, and two, not a, a lot of them have that experience, right? So, you know, we've spent the last 30 minutes talking about the country um, as a service-based environment, right? You know, specifically IT transforming into something else. And I don't think that country has yet hit the inflection point uh, where founders think that way. Um, in the majority of the cases, when I speak to at least first time founders, their concern is about getting money to build a product. And it's never really the concern is how do I get the market and scale and how do I sell to my consumers and how do I get that right? Um, and I think that's the biggest difference is, is the mentality. It's really not the talent. It's not the smarts. It's not even the financing. I think all of those things will come into play. Um, very similar to China. I mean, China was an IT environment or an outsourcing environment for almost 15 years before enough younger people said, hey, wait a minute, you know, we, ha we have a large enough market where you know, I could build something and I could be successful at it. And I could stand behind this product, right? Um, and I really know how to sell things to people. Um, that, that trade is, I think, is not really pervasive in, in, in Ukraine at this point. Um, but I do think that that'll happen out of all the Eastern European countries. It's the reason why I'm so close with Peter and I, and, you know, we, you know, we know a lot of people there. Um, it's just because by population and by size, uh, you know, Ukraine is the, is the second largest country in that block, right? And so I think the people of Ukraine have that opportunity. When they'll get that awareness and when they'll get that particular skill set, um, I don't know. And when that culture will, you know, and that mentality changes um, to be more consumer, you know, focused, to be more sales oriented versus, you know, how do I build something, right? Um, because, you know, every time I talk to a founder there, I always tell them, you know, if, if, if as a firm, we invested in anybody with an idea, I'm sure that that person with enough money could get something built. The question yeah. is, 
what are they going to do with it when it gets built? Right. Mm -hmm. And most people kind of just drop from that point. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of innovation and there's a lot of this type of growth that's happening in Kiev where you're seeing a certain segment of the younger population now say, wait a minute, you know, I, I could build something and there'll be value for that and I can contribute. But how they go about doing that is I think something that they're learning. It's kind of, you know, Peter and I are both entrepreneurs, right? I was, you know, my background and, you know, I learned that the hard way, right? Um, in my first company, um, just kind of understanding how to hustle and kind of do everything at once. Um, I feel like a lot of the founders there feel like it's some sort of school. I don't know if Peter agrees with me, right? Like I want to be an entrepreneur and I have this great idea and here are the 10 steps for me to be a unicorn founder. And they don't realize there is no 10 steps, right? You, yeah. you just build it, right? And if you build it and you're successful, then you're great. And then those others, so when Peter says, well, I wonder, you know, when the Western, you know, environments will come in money and, you know, and, and really support the, the development of the country from an intellectual property standpoint. Uh, I don't think there'll ever be any, there'll, be any, there'll never be a point or there'll never be some sort of rule that triggers that. I think, I think that the younger people of that country have, have to exponentially scale up, right, their country, right? And Ukraine, you know, has a grip, you know, Peter, you know, said it really well, the cost of living is great and it's comfortable. Um, but I would argue maybe that comfort isn't such a good thing, even if it's one of the, because, it, because, you know, if you look at, you know, uh, income per capita, it's the large, you know, Ukraine is the largest country in, 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 in that region. It's also the poorest per capita. So it, when you have those two economic, uh, Jason, 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 uh, here, I would uh, argue with you. I think we need some arguing in our uh, discussion, right, David? Yes. So, because yes. without arguing, it's going to be very boring. <laughs> right. Yes. I don't know if it's and, arguing, but it's maybe you could disagree. Okay. 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 I will uh, state my disagreement. When you uh, give some official figures about Ukraine, for example, income per capita, for example, uh, usually most of those figures are heavily distorted because they don't include so-called gray market. They don't include the economy that's not taxed. Sounds so familiar. If, Sounds yes, familiar. Yes. If you look at Ukraine only based on official figures, it's a very, very poor country. But when you come to Kiev uh, and you see all the cars around, all the restaurants yeah, around. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. So Ukrainian people are not that poor if you wait in all the unofficial income. It's not the richest company, uh, sorry, country in Europe, definitely. But I think it's uh, very comparable to countries like Poland, uh, Hungary, and similar. And yeah, yeah. especially I, I'm talking, Kiev. Yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I'm, I agree with you because I've been to Ukraine. I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I, guess, I guess I'm really speaking in general then, right? I mean, I agree with you in the sense that there are, there's external income factors that manipulate those numbers. But I mean, there's almost 50 million people in Ukraine outside of Kiev and maybe Odessa. Um, I mean, the vast, I mean, there's, I mean, you know, Ukraine is not Kiev and Odessa, right? It's an entire country. And, yep. you know, last I checked, there's still, you know, 80% of that population, 80, 85% is outside of those two major cities. And I guess the point that I'm making, Peter, is that for Ukraine to reach a, a certain pinnacle of financial, I guess, success, right? We're talking maybe top 10 GDP in the world, you know, going from a service to a product environment, you know, that distribution of intellectual property and wealth has to be distributed among all of its citizens well. And I think for that to happen, there has to be more entrepreneurialism. And I think for that to happen, you know, it just takes a lot of younger people um, to really fight for that and, and to really understand how to bring their, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that I, I am seeing younger people do that and their mentality is now changing. I don't know when the mentality will completely change like, you know, you know, I would love it in some time in the future if I ever visited and I saw you again. I, I saw companies that didn't want to always be global, right? I mean, there's so many founders that I meet that says, well, how do I get into the U.S. market, right? And I really want to sell there because I can make a lot of money. Well, the first thing I'm thinking in my brain is, how are you going to sell in the United States when you don't even know how to sell in Ukraine, right? You, you, have, to, yes. you, have, to under, you have to start some, You have to start somewhere. I mean, I started somewhere. You started somewhere. So I think... 
I think there's this mentality that like there's founders in Ukraine that there's steps. Step one, you know, I you know handle the legalization of my company. Step it's very mechanical the thinking. Step two, you know, I go and hire people. Step three, I go and raise some money from friends and family. Step four, you know, I need sales. I don't know what to do, and it all stops. And at that point, they say, well, five, I need to go and get help, and other people and help me sell this product. And since I, since Ukraine is such a small market, you know, I want to go global. It, 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 and what they've essentially done is they've made their life more complicated and they don't understand the basics of being an entrepreneur, right? The basics of being an entrepreneur is not necessarily following steps, but doing what you have to do to get to a very successful business in terms of sales. Um, because as Peter knows, right? I mean, financing is not the best option, right? I mean, if Peter and I started a business tomorrow, I'm pretty sure our goal would never be to take financing because we're pretty yep. confident that we could get to get a business to scale. And, you know, we only need investors if we need to grow the business, not to survive. And I think what's happening in Ukraine is that there's a lot of younger people who don't have that skill and they haven't learned it yet, right? Because they're so used to being in the IT service or kind of service-based culture. And, um, and so I think that that'll happen at some point in the future. I don't know when. I also think Western institutions probably will not come in to help these founders until they see that. They need to see that, right? It's kind of like, you know, proof of business. Can you, can you build something and can you do it right? And can you, can, have you demonstrated you can get to market, generate some sales or something, right, on your own without help from anybody? And if, and if you've been able to prove that, then yeah, then, you know, maybe we can help out. And, but I, I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, until kind of this culture change and this experience comes naturally with that kind of shift. But yeah. I, I agree with you, Peter. I, I yeah. do think that the income levels in the bigger cities aren't indicative of the statistics. Absolutely. But uh, in Asia, what I have observed, uh, young people very quickly change way of thinking and they, they learn very quickly. For example, for uh, about uh, Indonesia and the Vietnam, uh, for the last 30 years, uh, all the media and then investor, and they talk about, uh, okay, Indonesia has a huge population and growing consumer, et cetera, et cetera, but never change. But uh, for the last 10 years, I have seen the dramatic change of uh, Indonesia and Vietnamese startup scene. They, they become very uh, entrepreneur and then very interesting. In the, in China, Korea, yeah. Japan, they usually start a business in home country. They don't. They uh, they seldom think about expanding beyond their home country because their local market is big enough, right? But if you look at right. the, the startup, the Southeast Asian small economy, then that they always start their business plan right. of the startup from the beginning as a regional company. So that, I mean, but David, they're, they're... I've looked at, yeah, I, I, yeah we've, we've looked at a number of countries. I mean, obviously we're global, so we've looked at even startups and emerging businesses out of that territory. But if you look at all of them and cut through all the, the attributes, right, of why someone would invest in someone, at least from a financing standpoint, you know, there's, there's common attributes. And, and it still remains that most of the successful startups or companies that deserve an investment for growth or companies that have proven something within their local markets. So I would argue it doesn't really matter if it's Singapore or if it's Malaysia. Most of the companies that we've seen that do well have done something, at least something to prove market, right? Feasibility within even their local markets before they say, okay, you know, you know, in order for us to grow, you know, to your point, we have to go beyond borders. And, you know, that evolution in their business accelerated because they're a smaller country and they have a sm smaller market. But I still believe that those com companies, um, you know, really build something within their own country. I think in Ukraine, I just see a faster acceleration um, or, you know, the mindset is much more global than it is local, you know, mm -hmm. for all kind of the general challenges that, that, that Peter mentioned early in the call. And I think that's a shame, right? Because at the end of the day, if I was an entrepreneur in, 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 in Ukraine, I would say this is the easiest market for me to dominate. So why couldn't I dominate that? And so I don't really want to go into the United States until I've really dominated my region. And that should be in orders of man magnitude easier than going outside the country. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's very counterintuitive thinking. So when I meet a founder that are there that's immediately into expanding and 
they haven't really dominated their market. Um, I, I tend to want, I tend to uh, get concerned about that because I wonder if that's a confidence issue underlying that, or is that some other, or is that a cultural issue? And I, and, and I think that's by and large what most VCs look at when they look at Ukrainian companies. It, it's really the people, right? You know, at that stage, you're not going to have enough revenue where you can judge a business on its metrics. You have to judge it on its people by and large and their experience. And if their gut is, I want to go global very quickly because I need sales, you know, my counter argument would be, well, why, why can't you get some of that here, right, proportionally? Yes. I think people, they will learn. They will try and learn, right? Yeah, I think, I think this is why it's going to take some, this is my opinion. I think it's going to take some years Right, but it's clearly happening. Right, I'm not saying the country should become nationalistic. Right, uh, you know, I'm not speaking from a political standpoint, but from an economic development standpoint, you know, clearly they should be able to have some pride and service their own business. I think another big problem, I think, with Ukraine, and this is a big challenge, and I don't know if Peter agrees with me, but I have to, I have to, to add to one, one very interesting oh, point ahead, to what Jason mentioned. Yeah. Uh, the interesting point is that when we talk about the countries like Vietnam, I've been to Vietnam. I've never been to Indonesia, uh, but uh, I know something about Vietnam. When we talk about some other Asian countries and when we talk about countries from Eastern Europe like Ukraine and similar, those people, especially young people, they don't think that somebody owes them something. They don't feel any entitlement for anything. Like people in very well developed uh, Western countries, like Europe, Western Europe and US. Uh, so, because uh, in Western Europe, young people often feel that somebody owes them something. Somebody usually means the government uh, or older generation. But because there are many countries in the world, like Asia, like Eastern Europe, where people don't have such feeling, they have to fight for themselves. Nobody owes them something, they have to get it. Agreed. They have to build the company, not necessarily IT company. They have to build something. Uh, they cannot rely that if they're out of job, somebody comes and gives them some, I don't know, some monthly income. Nobody will, especially in Asian countries, as far as I know. Uh, and uh, the great danger of uh, so-called young capitalist countries like Korea, for example, is to move too quickly to this Western uh, feeling of comfort. And if you do, I don't know, I cannot judge uh, Korea at all. But if you do it, then you lose a lot of in your entrepreneurship. And when we talk about uh, these uh, worldwide centers of entrepreneurship, like uh, California, New York, London, Israel, Berlin, we all know that a lot of companies being set up in these centers, they've been set up by immigrants. A lot of immigrants coming from very different countries, they set up the companies uh, together with locals, not necessarily on their own, and they win the world because they don't have this feeling that somebody owes them something. Agreed. That's my little addition. Yeah, yeah, I th yeah, th yeah, that's a really great point about culture and, and kind of the mindset. I also just kind of want to add another comment is um, I think Ukraine... I think the biggest threat, right, and the biggest challenge, at least from a business perspective, facing Ukraine is really not political. Because, I, because you, know, you know, contrary to popular belief, I think Ukraine, the Western environments look at it as a very an unstable, potentially an unstable political environment, right? But, it, but I don't think so. I've been there enough times where I feel like it's a very safe and stable environment. I mean, this, the Ukrainian spirit is very strong, you know, in terms of democratic principles. And they're just evolving, right? Their legal system is terrible. And it's not just with IT. I mean, you know, we were, you know, David, you and I had this conversation about, you know, even other sectors within Eastern Europe where uh, the rule of law isn't very strong. It's not just in IT, but it's in real estate. But all these things are growing, right? But I think the biggest challenge from a business perspective over the next couple of years is going to be, you know, the loss of talent. So, you know, as Peter said, you have a lot of Western countries um, and institutions going in there for IT talent. And they're making it so expensive, right? So the economy to scale are not growing around services. And it's becoming so difficult to hire talented people at times that my bigger concern is that it's going to stunt its own internal product development growth. Meaning if, you, if you're a Ukrainian, you set up a company and you want to build something, right? Which would 
you know, by and large, you know, have an impact and a value to Ukrainians, right? Um, how do you do that when you can't even afford your own talent, right? So that that's kind of an interesting dynamic, right? That I can look that that I feel when I'm when I'm in Kiev, and sometimes when I meet Peter, I don't think we've ever talked about it. Um, but it's something that's on the top of my mind when I, when I look at companies and founders who are trying to build companies out of Ukraine. My heart goes out to them because at some point they're not even going to be able to innovate because of the, because of the cost factor. Um, and I think if you look at other growing economies like China and India, where they had big, you know, kind of STEM talent, and they went from manufacturing into information technology services and now to product, they had a longer duration. So India's runway, right, was almost 15 years, and China's was almost, you know, coming up on 15 years of that type of transformation. So it, it took some time for those countries, I think, given the market size, um, where they could still have enough talent, and the cost was, I guess, affordable enough, where they could still handle, you know, IT outsourcing, and still some level of product development cost efficiently, right? Um, and I think in Ukraine, it's a choice right now. It's not either or. I mean, if Peter and I set up a, you know, a company and we wanted to create a product in Ukraine and hire Ukrainian developers, it would be just as costly, if not more. I mean, Peter, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, we're competing with like an IBM or a Ubisoft or whatever for that same talent. There's no, there's no benefit for, being, for me being a, a Ukrainian citizen or a national wanting to build my own company for, for, from within my borders like some of these other, like, you know, like India and, and China and maybe South Asia, they, they had those opportunities. I don't know if those opportunities will necessarily, or that ad, that condition will apply in the future. And, that's, and I think that's, a, that's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, I would add to what you've said. There is another co co country, which uh, example of which is even more uh, telling than Ukrainian example. Uh, because Ukraine, as you said, it's around 40 million people give it uh, give or take and it's still a considerable company in size but there is israel which is tiny country and doesn't have any internal market for anything so the only way for israeli entrepreneur to make a successful company is to go outside of the country and i must yeah. say that ukraine ukraine is uh, sort of repeating this great example of uh, uh, startup development that Israel shown to everybody. And it's uh, worth mentioning that a lot of people in Israel, they have uh, Ukraine uh, past. They are coming from Ukraine. They came from Ukraine. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of Israeli uh, presidents and prime ministers, they've been born in Ukraine, actually, if you don't know this. And uh, there is a great connection between two countries. A lot of Israeli entrepreneurs are now living and uh, building companies in Ukraine. And they know a lot of know-how. They can connect Ukrainian companies and entrepreneurs to Western VCs and Israeli VCs. So that's a very good example. Yeah. And Ukraine, I think, is trying to repeat this example. That's what I uh, observed about Lithuania, right? I have seen a lot of Lithuanian uh, entrepreneurs who set up, grow the huge business in other part of the world. And then I look at the Lithuania, it's a very tiny country. So I was uh, so yes. impressed. Ukrainian, yeah. uh, sorry, Lithuania is even less than Kiev. Yes, that's what I saw. So uh, it's a challenge issue is not a real problem. That's the, some, uh, also the, I mean, great opportunity, right? Open the door for- the, That's a great advantage of right. IT business. Okay. In order to build a serious IT business, you don't need to come from a big country as it was before, because in order to build a real business like railroad, like consumer business, uh, before you should you should be coming from really big company country, so like Germany, like United Kingdom, US, China, and so on. But right now the world is so global. You don't need to come from any big country. You can live in Estonia, Agreed. and you know some unicorns coming from Estonia. Right. But Estonia right. is one and a half million people. It's like your yeah. uh, little district in but Peter, but Peter, but Peter, Yeah, Peter, I agree with both of you and David. All I'm saying is that from a product innovation standpoint, how do you innovate when the cost of labor is, you know, is higher for you in country than it is if you, 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 you essentially can't outsource it, right? Every other country in this world has been able to outsource and get some leverage, 
right? And so even if the Ukraine, I, I, that's, I think that's one of the internal challenges of the country is fostering entrepreneurs who can afford to do innovation within your own country at some point. That's all I'm saying. Okay. And, and it's, good to, it's good to be global, but the issue with global is that that money is, doesn't stay within the Ukrainian system. And so as a VC who's looking to invest in product companies, not service companies, right, as a venture investment, that's a big concern for us. Because how, do you, how, how, how does a Ukrainian entrepreneur living in Kiev scale up their internal operation when the cost of doing business is, is so high? They can't even do it themselves. Essentially, when you start a business there, you're competing with a Ubisoft or an IBM for that talent. And so there's, there's just no way to get any kind of leverage. So I guess the Ukrainians can then start outsourcing to Indian, uh, you know, Indians or maybe some other country that comes up, right? But it does, you know, but, but when they do that, that, you know, that, that benefit doesn't stay within that country, right? So the Western countries that have been very successful, it, it, you know, have had a very simple model, right? I mean, when they innovate, they do something in their own country, but eventually to get scale, they can reach some sort of cost efficiency by outsourcing that to different countries. Yes. In, in, in Ukraine, you can't outsource that really to different countries because that's where people come to. So that, that, yep. that I think is the conundrum. You know what I mean? How do you unlock that, right? As a, as a society, how does, how, how do, how does, and that's a broader question that's probably bigger than me and Peter, right? But, right. but I think this goes to Peter's earlier statement that, you know, there needs to be more political stability and legal stability so that at the end of the day, I think, you know, the people in that country also have an opportunity to become an IP focused, you know, nation where a lot of their development um, and economic benefits stay within that country, right? I mean, yes. we, we, when you outsource, you're also outsourcing cash, right? And the quality of life doesn't impact the people uh, that are doing, you know, that are outsourcing necessarily, right? So that's all I'm right. saying. Right. This has been the longest talk show for me. So uh, let me ask a final <laughs> question. And then we can continue to have a chat and no, conversation. No, no, no. See, they, whole they lot, whole up. evening. <laughs> okay, let me ask him. Peter. So, uh, uh, please tell me your thought about the future of Ukraine as a global innovation hub. Uh, the brief answer. I don't. I don't know. If you want a better answer, I have high hopes uh, that uh, somehow. People are coming to Ukraine from different great countries of the world, bring something new, bring something that they already achieved in their uh, respective countries. And Ukrainian people, uh, as I like to say, steal it with proud uh, and uh, build uh, better companies and better co economies eventually. That's my hope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jason and the Peter for the taking time to sharing the, your insightful idea and opinion about the Ukraine market. Thank you very much, David, so, for hosting us. Yeah, thank you, David. As always, it was a pleasure having this conversation, and I really appreciate my friend Peter for being on this call. Um, uh, you know, and uh, I wish you guys the best. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye.